when you eat is as important as what you eat, at least as it relates to health parameters, in particular liver health and mental health. First of all, when you eat, typically your blood glucose, your blood sugar will go up. Also, insulin levels will go up. How much your glucose and insulin go up depends on what you eat and how much you eat. In general, simple sugars, including fructose from fruit, but also sucrose and glucose and simple sugars will raise your insulin and blood glucose more than complex carbohydrates. Grains and breads and pastas and so forth will raise your blood glucose more than fibrous carbohydrates like lettuce and broccoli and things of that sort. Protein has a somewhat moderate or modest impact on insulin and glucose and fat has the lowest impact on raising your blood glucose and blood insulin. When we eat food consisting of carbohydrates, our digestive system breaks down the digestible ones into glucose that later enters the blood. This increases the level of our blood glucose, and as a result, the pancreas produces insulin, a hormone that assists our cells to absorb blood glucose for energy. Foods that are rich in carbohydrates cause blood glucose to rise the most, and such foods like rice, fruits, and sugar can quickly be converted into energy. So what you eat will impact how steep a rise in blood glucose glucose and insulin takes place. And there are a number of factors that are related to your individual health that will also dictate how steep and how high that rise in glucose and insulin will be. Think of it this way. Blood sugar and insulin go up when you eat. They go down when you don't eat. And other hormones go up when you don't eat. So there are hormones associated with the fasted state and there are hormones associated with the eating and having just eaten state. According to research, intermittent fasting initiates the repair of important cells in the body that also helps burn fat. Intermittent fasting also has a significant effect on the body's insulin levels. If you fast for as much as 16 hours, it gives your body a chance to rest and allows blood levels of insulin to drop significantly. Not only does it help burn the body fat, but it also lowers your risk of diseases like diabetes. This indicates that intermittent fasting has a benefit beyond weight loss and that it can be very helpful for people who struggle with high blood pressure and blood glucose levels. So insulin and glucose go up when we eat and it takes some period of time for them to go down. Even if we stop eating, they will remain up for some period of time and then go back down. It takes time. This is very important because if you look at the scientific literature on fasting, on time-restricted feeding, it's absolutely clear that the health benefits, not just the weight loss benefits, but that the health benefits from time-restricted feeding occur because certain conditions are met in the brain and body for a certain amount of time. And that gives us an anchor from which to view what eating is in terms of how it sets conditions in the body over time. Everything I'm going to tell you is true also for humans, and we know this now from human studies. One of the most important things to take away from this study was that mice that ate a highly palatable, high-fat diet, a great-tasting diet, but only during a restricted feeding window of each 24-hour cycle, maintained or lost weight over time. Whereas mice that ingested the same diet, same amount of calories, but had access to those calories around the clock, gained weight, became obese, and quite sick. And as an additional second point, the mice that restricted their feeding window to a particular portion of eight hours of every 24-hour cycle actually showed some improvement in important health markers. And what was even more incredible is that mice that only ate during a particular feeding window also experienced some reversal of some prior negative health effects. Eating the majority of your calories earlier in the day and limiting how much you eat in the evening or through the overnight hours may enhance your digesting process. You may be surprised to learn that 80%, 80% of the genes in your body and brain are on a 24-hour schedule. That is, they change their levels going from high to low and back to high again across the 24-hour cycle. And when those genes are high at the appropriate times and low at the appropriate times, meaning their expression is high and low at the appropriate times, when that happens, your health benefits. When those genes are not expressed at the right times, when they're high or low at the wrong times of each 24-hour cycle, that's when you get negative health effects. The health consequences of diet depend partly on the food that you consume in the first half of your day. Eating at night may contribute to weight gain. This indicates that obesity results in part from a mismatch between meal timing and the natural day-night cycle or circadian rhythm. Eating at any time of the day without following a specific time frame can have a negative effect on your health. This study showed that when mice restrict their eating to an eight-hour period within the most active phase of their 24-hour cycle, many of the genes that are associated with these so-called circadian clocks underwent a very regular entrainment, a locking in to the proper 24-hour schedule. And 
while this was in mice, we now know that this also occurs in humans. The results they saw underscore this point. What they saw is that the peaks in these clock genes became very regular and the dips in these clock genes became very regular. And that led to a whole host of really important positive health effects. Conversely, when mice ate whenever they wanted across the 24-hour cycle, these clock genes became really out of whack. And the negative health consequences were the downstream result of these changes in these clock genes. This has now also been shown to be true for humans. So if you want to be healthy, you want your organ health, your metabolic health to be entrained properly, one of the most important things you can do is to view light at the appropriate times of each 24-hour schedule and to not view light at other times of that schedule and to eat at the appropriate time of each 24-hour day. According to Huberman, you should not ingest any food within the first hour of waking up and not ingest food two to three hours before going to sleep. When we fast for a specific time or during sleep, our body undergoes a process called autophagy that recovers the cells and tissues in the body. By not eating in the first 30 minutes after waking up, you're taking advantage of the fast that you were already in during sleep. Just as a foundation, it's very clear from the research in humans that not eating any food or ingesting any calories, liquid or otherwise, for the first 60 minutes after waking up each day and for the two to three hours prior to your bedtime, that's ideal for the parameters that we've discussed earlier. It's very clear that it's best to extend the sleep-related fast either into the morning or to start it in the evening. Now, this might seem kind of obvious, but it's actually not so obvious. You could place that feeding window early in the day, middle of the day, or late in the day. Let's think about what happens when we sleep. When we sleep, our body undergoes a number of different processes in the brain and body in order to recover the cells and tissues. Many of you have probably heard of autophagy, which is essentially a cleaning up, a gobbling up of dead cells and cells that are injured or sick. And this is a natural process that occurs and it occurs mainly during sleep, although not only during sleep. Fasting of any kind does tend to enhance autophagy. It is not the only way to create autophagic conditions. Autophagic conditions can be created simply by following a subcaloric diet. And there are other things that one can do in order to trigger autophagy. But fasting does trigger autophagy. So when we're asleep, the bad cells are getting gobbled up and eaten. And the good cells also are undergoing certain repair mechanisms, mainly related to, or at least governed by those circadian genes that we talked about earlier, those clock genes. So you're already fasting when you're asleep and how deep you are into that fast depends on how long it was since your last meal. So if you fast early in the day and you've been asleep for five, six, seven, eight hours, I would hope somewhere between six and eight hours for most people is going to be beneficial. When you wake up, I mentioned earlier that you don't want to eat for at least the first 60 minutes after waking, but were you to extend that fasting to say 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., or even 12 noon or later, you are taking advantage of the deep fast that you were in during sleep and certainly toward the end of sleep. Will you follow Andrew Huberman's advice and try out a time-restricted eating schedule? Let us know in the comment section below. If you found this video interesting or helpful, don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and press the notification bell so you won't miss any of our future uploads. Until then, take care.